Adaptive optics is a new technology that detects and corrects damaging um, or changing optical distortions. It has been applied to a great effect during the past decade for correcting astronomical telescopes for blurring due to turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. Dr. Max will describe how adaptive, adaptive optics works and how it is helping us to learn about the fate of black holes in mergers of nearby galaxies. The talk will conclude with a view of another application of adaptive optics, imaging the living human retina. Claire Max is a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she directs the Center for Adaptive Optics. She graduated from Radcliffe College and Princeton University, and was a physicist at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for many years, where she was the founding director of LLNL's branch of the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics. Dr. Max's research interests include adaptive optics, laser guide stars, and their use for extragalactic astrophysics. Dr. Max is a project scientist for the Keck University Observatory's Next Generation Adaptive Optics System. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, recipient of the James Madison Medal of Princeton University and the Ernest O. Lawrence Award in Physics from the U.S. Department of Energy. Dr. Max has a, is a fellow of the American Physical Society, the SPIE, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So without further ado, let's put our hands together for Dr. Claire Max. Good morning, it's great to be here. I'm having a wonderful time at the uh, poster sessions. I hope you are too. So I'm gonna talk about um, adaptive optics and the subtitle is Using Laser Beacons and Wavy Mirrors for a Clearer View of the Universe. And that's not an exaggeration, that's pretty much exactly what we're working on. And I'll describe why. So this is the, the slide that is supposed to make the case for why we need adaptive optics. It turns out that turbulence in the atmosphere not only makes stars twinkle, but as the light from a star goes through the turbulence and you try to focus it with a telescope, the light gets spread out by the turbulence and so it focuses just to a fuzzy blob and not to a nice little point. Of course, a star is to our, to our telescopes basically infinitely far away. So you should be seeing just a dot. And instead you're seeing this fuzzy blob. And I'll show you in a minute what the fuzzy blob looks like. Uh, but the result of this is that even the largest ground-based telescopes, the 30 meter telescopes that I've been using at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, have no better spatial resolution than a little eight inch telescope that you may have used in the backyard or maybe your school has one or your uncle brought one to a party one time. And uh, these big telescopes don't see any better than, than those little ones. And so that's what we're trying to fix. If you've ever looked through a little telescope, you can actually see um, some of the, if, I don't know if you can see this very well. This is a craters, craters on the moon. Here's a crater, here's a crater, here are two more craters. And this is what the video looks like even through a modest sized telescope. And all these squiggles and squirminesses of course aren't on the moon. They are what the atmospheric turbulence does to the light as it comes through the last few kilometers of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, a personal story, I first got interested in astronomy when I looked through a telescope and saw a picture very much like this. Uh, I was at a summer camp when I was eight years old, and the science counselor picked up on how excited I was. In particular, there were mountains that I was looking at, right, kind of in this, in this corner, oops, in this corner over here, there were some mountains. And uh, I thought, wow, those look like mountains on Earth. This must be pretty cool. So having a mentor, even, even in middle school, uh, was very important to me in, ter in terms of his encouragement to continue and delve more deeply into why these things seem so interesting to me. Uh, I also got very interested in stargazing. I can't quite see you guys out there, but how many of you have gone on a stargazing evening? So a fair number of you. So there's lots of different ways you can do this. Go out in the country where the lights of the city aren't so bright and just look up, lie down on a blanket, look at the sky, or bring a telescope, or go to a sidewalk astronomy uh, session on Saturday nights but it's something that's brought me a lot of joy, and I, and I hope you would enjoy it too. Okay, back to the story here. 
Uh, let's see, I'm not doing too well. I'm going to have to advance it like this. Okay. So, um, these are three images of a perfectly ordinary bright star taken with a modest sized telescope. And when you take a long exposure of an image, it looks like this. This is about one second of arc across. That's just a unit of angle. But it's not at all like this if you take a very short time exposure that's short enough that it freezes the turbulence in the atmosphere at one position. Of course, the turbulence is always changing. But if you could take just a snapshot that froze the turbulence in one, at one, um, one manifestation of it, it wouldn't look round at all. It just looks like there's bunches of little speckles. And then the next time you look, the turbulence will have changed and it'll be a bunch of other little speckles. And when you add them all up over a long exposure, they come out to be something more or less round. But that's not what we want. We want to get down uh, to much better spatial resolution so that this supposedly dot-like star would look much more like a dot. And that's what adaptive optics does. Another way to think of it is it uses a, a wiggly mirror to take all of these little speckles and pile them on top of each other and make them one brighter uh, point in the middle. So just to give you an idea of how serious this is, um, this is what a star looks like when you zoom way in on it, so it's very, very magnified in size, as you can see, and also very much slowed down, so you're seeing the turbulence as it changes. And it's really a mess, right? I mean, not only do you see these little speckles, but it's kind of wandering around. And that's another thing that turbulence does, is it moves the star around on the sky. So we want to fix that. And um, this is roughly how we do it. So here's your favorite galaxy that you want to study tonight. A galaxy is a collection of uh, maybe a trillion stars or more. Uh, but you have, in our galaxy, there's a you're lucky that there's a bright star nearby that's bright enough that you can use the light from that star to measure the turbulence hundreds of times a second. And then you calculate on a computer. My son tells me this computer is way out of date. I should get a new picture. <laughs> um, you calculate on a computer the shape that you want to apply to this wavy mirror. This is literally a mirror that changes its shape. It's after the main mirror of the telescope, before the light goes into the camera. And then the light from both your favorite galaxy and the star bounces off that mirror and uh, you can do your science. And when you've done that, that wavy thing that we saw on the last slide uh, turns into this. So here's the same picture of the star you saw before. Here's what it is after. And um, this is just one star. Uh, there's another image that I hope you'll be, be able to see that was taken on the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona. Um, so this is before the adaptive optics is turned on. It's, there's the fuzzy blob, and there's what you see when uh, the, the adaptive optics is on. So now it's off. You can't tell that it's two stars. Now it's on, and you certainly can. Okay. So, of course, we're not only interested in taking pictures of stars. If we could take a perfect picture of a star, all we'd see is a dot. So that's not so interesting. But, uh, for example, for planets, here are some... Three images of Neptune, uh, one of the planets in our solar system, in infrared light in this case. This is what Neptune looks like without any adaptive optics, just with the turbulence in the atmosphere on a, the, what the largest ground-based telescope uh, that's used for optical astronomy. It doesn't look like much. There's sort of two blobs here, and that's it. The Hubble Space Telescope, of course, is above the turbulence, and so it does much better. Um, and you can start to see these cloud bands and a little polar feature. And there's lots of interesting stuff going on at the South Pole as well. But it's only a 2.4 meter telescope. And optics theory tells us that the bigger the telescope, the more fine features you should see, if you can correct for the turbulence in the atmosphere. So here's an image with Keck. Sure enough, you know, at this wavelength, we're seeing much more fine scale features. And each of these things is uh, originate. This is, these are all clouds. And they originated in a storm in one location, and the ferociously large winds that blow around the circumference of Neptune drags the clouds out until they're spread out all over um, in that latitude band. And we've actually used this effect to measure the winds on Neptune, even though we're not anywhere near Neptune. So how does this all work? I talked about a wavy mirror. Now I'm going to 
make it a, a more idealized mirror. This is a, the zeroth order cartoon of how you can fix uh, the turbulence using a mirror. So um, the light is coming from the left. One of the things you notice in optics class is light always comes from the left, never make it come from the right. I don't know what would happen, but it wouldn't be good. Um, so uh, this line here, if it was a straight line up and down, is meant to show that the phase of these light waves is completely uniform along a plane coming out of the board. So when you see a straight line, it's, it's called in physics a planar wavefront, and then you can focus that to a perfect point. But let's imagine that the turbulence in the atmosphere messed it up and made this notch in the wavefront so that the phase in this part of the wavefront is ahead of the phase in that part. And, um, so what you do is you make a notch in your deformable mirror that's half as deep as this notch in the wave. And then you make the light bounce in and out. So by the time it's traveled in both directions, the back part of the wavefront has had time to catch up with the front part. And then when it comes out, it's this perfect plane wave again. So uh, that's what you do. Of course, a re real deformable mirror uh, doesn't look like that. but all the formal mirrors even out these optical path differences, and here's what one looks like in more real life terms. So it's a, a little thin sheet of glass. You push and pull on the back of it with little actuators, and they know what to do because you send a little voltage to them and they get longer and shorter. And again, the light comes in if there's a part that's ahead. You make it travel farther, so by the time it bounces back, uh, everything is caught up with itself. Okay, so uh, that works great if you've got a bright star near your favorite galaxy, because if it's close, the light from the star and the galaxy both go through the same turbulence. But clearly, if you make the star too far away, its light that you wanted to use to measure the turbulence is going through different turbulence than the light from your favorite galaxy. So that's not going to help you at all. In fact, it can make things worse. And if you ask how many stars there are in the sky that are bright enough, Close your eyes and think about this, the sky. The sky is mostly black. There are not likely to be bright stars near a random place in the sky where your wimpy little galaxy might be. And so um, that's the dilemma. Less than 5% of the objects at random places in the sky are going to have this good bright star nearby. I'm wondering if somebody might be able to close that door. OK. Um, so what you do is you make your own star. So here's, here's your distant galaxy again, and you shine a laser, it turns out, up into the atmosphere. I'll tell you how in a minute. And then you can just shine it on whatever position you want. If this is your favorite galaxy, you shine it right there, and you measure the turbulence that way. Um, if you're looking at another galaxy here, you can shine it there, and you've got much more flexibility. So this is what these lasers look like when they're coming out of a telescope dome. It looks dra more dramatic in these images because they're time exposures. It's actually rather hard to see, but it's fun to show these pictures. So um, the, here's the principle of it. Uh, it turns out that at a height of about 90 kilometers in the atmosphere, there's a layer of air where there's a lot of sodium atoms. And, and they come from little teeny micrometeorites that are zooming into the atmosphere and starting to get hot from friction against the air molecules. And that's the place where they get hot enough that they just sort of evaporate away. And they leave all their atoms up there in this, in this layer. So we shine yellow light straight up or in the direction of your favorite galaxy. And it excites these sodium atoms with an atomic transition. And they re-radiate this yellow light in all directions, and you catch some of it. And it's the, the one that you catch coming through your telescope makes the artificial star that can be pointed anywhere. So another personal story, in the, in the summer of 1983, I joined a, a group called the Jasons, which advised the Defense Department about critical technology issues. I can tell you more about it afterwards if you're interested. I was the first woman in the group. It was a little terrifying. I was taken aside by the executive director ahead of time and told that these men were going to be ferocious and eat me alive and so forth, and it wasn't anything like that at all, so that was good. Anyway, the previous summer, the group had suggested the concept of using this kind of yellow laser to make an artificial star, and I realized how useful the idea could be for astronomy. Um, so we said, uh, 
We said so in a classified report, which was amusing. Classified reports usually are about military things. This one had a whole chapter on how this would revolutionize astronomical telescopes on the ground. Um, but it wasn't declassified until eight years later when we could finally discuss it. And uh, it was a very, very dramatic meeting where it was declassified. This was uh, at a meeting of the American Astronomical Society. And all of these very highly respected folks stood up and told the astronomers uh, what they had been doing. And there were astronomers in the audience who had been struggling with much less money and much less uh, sophistication to do what the military people had been doing for the last eight years. And they, they had a hard time afterwards. They were kind of bitter that they hadn't been told about this sooner. I can't blame them. There's no particular reason why the technologies that you just heard about are so secret or were so secret. Um, the motivation was at the time, and this might be germane, oddly enough, with this Ukraine crisis now where we're starting to think about Russia in a different way. Uh, the Russians were launching about a satellite per day in the early 80s, and we had no idea what they were, most of them. And so the, the thought was if you could take clean pictures of the satellites, you could at least figure out uh, what the function was. Anyway, um, my, my personal story about this is that just after that meeting where everything was declassified, I had lunch with a colleague of mine at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and we were commenting how surprised we were that nobody had actually tried to build one of these lasers. Um, by the end of lunch, it was a rather long lunch, <laughs> by the end of lunch, we had convinced each other that if nobody else was going to build one, we should. And um, at that point, it was a bit crazy. The laser that we used at Lawrence Livermore, which is shown here, I'll tell you about it in a second, was a thousand watts, a kilowatt laser, um, which was way, way, way more light than you needed. Today we use 10 watt lasers, but this is what we had. And um, it was an attractive nuisance as the police called it, we found out. There was a lady in Pleasanton about 10 miles away who would call the police, every police department that she could find in the area when she saw the laser beam. And she would insist that there was a UFO that was hovering <laughs> over, ser this is serious, hovering over Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and shining this laser down and it was sucking up all the secrets. <laughs> and uh, we had a chance to talk to some of the local police guys because we gave them a tour of our, of our little outside laboratory here and they were very amused by it, but they said it was sort of a headache because they had to take her seriously. You know, if you're a policeman, you have to listen to these things. Anyway, this, what we did is we, there was a big giant laser in a building on the, uh, on the Livermore campus, it went through a tunnel to go to a laboratory, and we put a little turning mirror in the tunnel and shined it straight up. So here it was coming straight up out of its pipe, and we used that to, uh, with this little telescope here, to measure uh, the turbulence in the atmosphere and show that this whole thing could be done. And that was with a little half-meter telescope. Today, virtually every um, major telescope on the ground has one of these lasers. Here's three of them on the top summit of Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii. And there's another one back here that you can't see. So there's actually four. Um, and it's, it's just now starting to make a big difference in the kind of science you can do. So in the next part of my talk, oh, I, I, I guess there was one other thing I wanted to say. So um, this idea that we had of, of taking this existing laser that was a thousand watts, way, way, way more than was needed, and pointing it into the sky in the middle of a suburban valley, and um, ha having it be visible from all around was pretty crazy. And, uh, you know, we had no idea if it would work. We had written theory papers that said it would work. Um, but it was a big gamble. And it's an interesting example of um, Something that uh, one of my teachers once told me, which was fake it till you make it. I don't know if your teachers have told you that, and, and you don't have to tell me either whether they've said that, but what does that mean? It means if you're a little insecure, but you're really interested in something, and you think you can probably do it, but you know, you're not sure, go ahead and pretend that you can do it. Tell yourself, I can do this thing. You're faking it to yourself in a sense. I can, I can make this work. And if you keep at it, after a while, you convince yourself that you really can do it. And furthermore, you convince other people that it's worth encouraging you to do it, or maybe even supporting you to do it in our case. Um, 
A lot of people gave us moral support because they thought that this, this concept of laser guide stars could be transformative. So I have a little moral for you. I hate that. When I was in high school, I hated people who had morals, so I understand. But if you have a passion, if you're really taken by something, follow it and don't let other people talk you out of it just because it's odd or, or a little bit zany. Sometimes these things really work out and you'll be uh, doing something that you love. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk. The second part is talking about uh, astronomy, so how does adaptive optics help us learn about a particular topic in astronomy? It's used for lots of things. This is the topic that I've been working on, which is the fate of giant black holes in colliding galaxies. So that's a big mouthful. Um, but a less, a less formal title is this one here. That's not coming up. Cosmic train wrecks and colliding monster black holes. And <laughs> This is not an exaggeration. The galaxies collide with each other. They shred each other apart. And the black holes that started out in the middle of each of the two separate galaxies get caught, brought very close to each other. And we were interested in what happens when, when they get close to each other. So uh, the story, which this is the best of our understanding, is that most galaxies have giant black holes. They, they're big, 10 billion times the mass of our sun in some cases. Black holes are galactic trash bins. They suck in gas, and as the gas goes into the black hole, it gets very hot. And as I said, as these galaxies hit each other, their giant black holes might eventually merge together also and get even bigger, and by the way, emit something called gravitational waves that are like light waves, but they're gravity waves instead of light waves, which we hope to see sometime in the near future. Not me, but uh, the, the physics world in general. So, this sounds like hyperbole, but it really seems to be true. I wanted to backtrack a little bit and say, what is a galaxy, for those of you who don't remember? So galaxies are large systems of stars and gas, and they contain several million to several trillion stars. And here, are roughly three main forms. Uh, we're in a spiral galaxy like this one. This is the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest neighbor. Uh, there are elliptical galaxies which don't have gas but have more or less spherical bunches of uh, arrangements of stars. And then little irregular galaxies that sound, look exactly like their name, they can be uh, of many different forms. So just to orient you, here's what they look like when they collide. Uh, these are Hubble Space Telescope pictures of, of random galaxy collisions. So here's two spiral galaxies colliding, two more spiral galaxies. Here's probably what used to be an elliptical galaxy having just collided with the spiral. <coughs> you typically see these long tails that come out as the gravity force of one galaxy pulls on the gas of the other one. Sorry. <coughs> so if each of these galaxies started out with a black hole in its core, we want to know what happens after they crash together. Uh, so I have to tell you what, something about what is a black hole. Um, everybody seems to know this is uh, from the National Post, whatever that is. So they think that a black hole looks like this. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but in any case, it's a region of space that's ver so densely packed with matter that nothing, not even light, can get out. <coughs> that's why it's called black. How do we know that they're there? We can watch their gravitational influence on all the surrounding stuff, or uh, as matter falls into these black holes, it goes into one of these disk-like things and gets very, very hot right before it falls in, and we can see radiation, x-rays coming from the hot gas. <coughs> How big are black holes? Um, a black hole with the mass of the Earth would be one inch across, so very, 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 very dense. A black hole with the mass of the sun would be three miles across. A black hole with the mass of 100 million suns, uh, which are quite typical in the cores of these galaxies, would extend halfway between Mars and Jupiter from the sun. So it'd be a sphere that ends halfway between Mars and Jupiter, but with, uh, with a huge mass. So these are really very, very dense objects. They're the densest things we know about in the universe so far. 
Um, how do we see them? Well, it, this says, I don't know if you can all see this, it's black and it looks like a hole, so I say it's a black <laughs> hole, but we can do a little better than that. Um, so, so how do we really see them? As I said, here's the black hole. Sometimes they send out jets of relativistic particles and radio emissions, so we can tell that there's a black hole if we see one of these jets. Uh, as I said, the, um, the light doesn't come from the black hole itself, but gas is falling into it, and the hot gas emits x-rays and, uh, and light. And um, if, if we can watch the material circle around the black hole by, measure, by using measurements from the x-rays or the light emission, then we can tell how fast the material is going around it and use that to measure the mass of the black hole. So there's one physics fact that you have to know. And uh, it is that if you have an object over here that's moving toward us and it's emitting light, the color of the light will be a little bluer as seen by us than it was when it was originally emitted by the disk. And similarly, on this side, if this part of the disk is moving away from us, the light that we see from that side of the disk will look a little redder. And so you can actually measure the speed, the velocity, in and out of uh, of this plane here by looking at the color of specific spectral lines and seeing whether they're blue shifted or red shifted. And so that's how we're going to measure velocities. We're, and this is just an example from one of these galaxies. It's, it has a, they call this a telephone number in our business, <laughs> NGC 6240, New General Catalog 6240. You can forget that now. But it's a merger of two disk galaxies. And this is what the merger remnant looks like. Not particularly obvious what's going on. It's relatively nearby, 300 million light years from us, so that's nearby by our standards. If we look in here, which we will in a minute, it's got a double nucleus. Presumably, each of those nuclei used to be the nuclei of, nucleus of a parent galaxy, and they're just starting to merge together after the crash. And these, these are uh, these tidal tails that happened because of the merger. So, to try and motivate why this thing looks like the way it does, it looks kind of like a bow tie to me, actually, kind of like that. There's a, um, there's a, a video, which I hope you'll be able to see, that was done from a computer simulation by Josh Barnes. I don't know. Okay, so here are the two galaxies coming together. They're going to hit each other. Here are the tidal tails. And then they end up in this very tight configuration. So I'll show you one more time. <clears throat> These are very cool computer simulations to do for those of you who are interested in, uh, in computers. There is a, a website, which I can tell you about afterwards, where you can actually do these things on your own and look at your own simulations of colliding galaxies. So this is the final state that was in that movie, and here's one nucleus and here's the other. And if you imagine taking this whole picture and rotating it by 90 degrees, that's that's how you get the galaxy that we, were, we are look, about to look at. So here it is. And this is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope in visible light. Um, this is what this nucleus, just this part from here to here, looks like in infrared light when we use our adaptive optics. AO is adaptive optics. And um, so you see the nucleus from one galaxy, the nucleus from the other galaxy. You can see lots of brand new clusters of stars that were formed because the gas crashed into each other and got dense and formed stars. Uh, but it's not so obvious here, where are the two black holes? I'm, we think that there's one somewhere around here and one somewhere around there, but is that the black hole? Is that the black hole? Is that the black hole? Is this the black hole? Is, you know, completely unclear. So we came at this in two different ways. One of them is uh, black holes have very distinctive radio emission. And so, fortunately, uh, two of our colleagues had looked at this object in, in radio waves, and here was one, the place where one of the uh, black hole characteristic radio emissions was coming from, and here's the one where the other one was coming from. So we think that this guy is the north black hole. This black hole actually is partly hidden in optical and infrared light. It turns out that dust obscure shorter wavelength light more than longer wavelength light. <coughs> and so in the optical, you don't see this region at all. And in, in this wavelength, which is two microns, you sort of see it. And if you look at a little longer wavelength where the dust is less important, the black hole that we see is exactly where the radio black hole is. 
So that's one way to do it, is to use some other wavelength, like radio waves, to tell you where the black holes are. Uh, but there's another way, too, which I hinted at when I was gesturing around that disk of gas that's rotating around the, the cartoon black hole, which is to do it by using velocities. So I don't know if you've learned in your physics class about Kepler's law. If you have an object in rotation around a point mass, for example, a planet moving around its star, or a black hole, or uh, a point mass moving around a black hole, uh, then what you can do is say, OK, it's going to be in equilibrium when the inward force due to gravity of the black hole pulling on the material is just balanced by the outward centrifugal force because this object is rotating. And if you do that, you find that you can plot, if, if your sun or black hole is here uh, and velocity is going upwards and position is going sideways, uh, right near the point mass, say the black hole in this case, the velocities get very high because you, the gravity is so strong that you have to have tons and tons of centrifugal force to keep from falling into the black hole. As you get farther away from the black hole, uh, the gravity force is much weaker, and so you can move around it at a much more leisurely rate and still not fall in. So we actually are using just straightforward, uh, simple physics. If you do this in two dimensions, it turns out that you can make a, uh, a, a plot like this, where the colors correspond to velocity. So this is plus 200 kilometers per second, minus 200 kilometers per second. Here's where the black hole is in our model, right there. And so this material is approaching us like this side of the disk was. And this material is going away from us like that side of the disk was. And so we're seeing a disk edge on, and it's rotating. And uh, we can ask what model fits the data the best. And in this case, the black hole mass that we measured by, these, by two different <coughs> methods was about a billion times the mass of the sun. So this is a, quite a hefty black hole as these things go. There aren't too many that are known that are uh, bigger than that. And, uh, but we're slowly finding them. So just a, a summary of, of this plus quite related work that we're doing now, you can find where the black holes are. You can measure their mass. <coughs> we're deep into repeating this for many other late stage galaxy mergers. And a new thing that came out sort of as a, as a side benefit is that we found that virtually every one of these late stage galaxy mergers that we looked at, there were big disks of gas and stars that were spinning around the nuclear black holes. So uh, that actually has something to say about whether these black holes are eventually going to merge and, and how soon they'll merge together and make some giant burst of gravity waves that we might actually be able to see. So uh, let's see, that's what I just talked about, I think. Um, so one, one question that I sometimes get asked is, well, you know, galaxies are so far away, everything happens on a scale of billions of years, why should I care? Uh, well, maybe you should. Um, this is a cartoon of, um, of what a crash between the Andromeda galaxy and our Milky Way, this is our, our regular Milky Way seen side on, uh, when it might happen. And, um, this is about four billion years from now, so don't hold your breath or anything. You're not going to look up tomorrow and see this thing in the sky, but uh, if there's anybody left on Earth four billion years from now, uh, these two galaxies will collide and leave, us, uh, leave our Milky Way galaxy in a completely different form than it is now. Right now, we're sort of a flat disk that has spiral arms and rotates around. And once these two galaxies get finished with their collision, we'll end up being one of those spherical galaxies that I showed you in, in the very early in the talk. No gas left, just a sphere, sphere of, uh, of older and older stars. And this actually bothers me, I have to confess, that uh, I like our galaxy the way it is, so. <laughs> <laughs> and it also bothers me that, uh, you know, if there, even if there were life on Earth uh, left by then because our sun will be a red giant and the Earth will become very hot and maybe we'll have moved outward in the solar system, but I, I really wouldn't want to be there when this happened. <laughs> I don't know. 
You should definitely not lie awake at night worrying about this. <laughs> okay, then, the, then I have a secret extra feature, which is um, you can use this same technology to image cells in the living human eye. And this was one of the things that we realized in, um, in 1999 that this had, this had a wonderful other set of applications. Uh, as I said, it's the same, it's sa exactly the same technology that we use. And you can use this to study how human vision works, plus medical applications. You can look at diseases of the retina and ask how well is this particular therapy working and try and understand what happens in the course of a disease. So the first question you should ask is, why do I need adaptive optics to look at the eye, right? I see out fine, <laughs> what's the deal? Uh, well, it turns out that around the edge of your len lens and cornea, so here's, here's, uh, here's your lens in my cartoon approximation. Here's the pupil, which is that black part of your eye that opens up to let more light in when it's dark out and closes down when it's very bright. <clears throat> so your lens and cornea are attached to the white of your eye around the edges, and they're not perfectly attached. And so most of the time that doesn't matter for your vision because it's like this, your pupil is much smaller than the lens, so you're not even looking out through the part where the attachment isn't very good. But at night, your pupil gets big in the dark, and your pupil actually gets bigger than these regions which are much less optically uh, high quality, and you start seeing some distortions. And I don't know how many of you have had this experience. It varies from person to person, but a lot of people feel that at night, if they look around street lights, they don't just see a dot where the street light is, they see little uh, rays coming out of it, or, or sometimes people see, report seeing a circle around it. Um, and that's just from us looking out, but the same kinds of aberrations affect a, a researcher or a doctor who wants to look in. They have to look through this stuff too. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why until this happened, you couldn't even see individual cells in the, in the living human eye. Uh, people knew a lot about the eye because they would take cadavers and cut out the eye and study the retina. I think this is far preferable myself. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a nice way to illustrate this. Uh, along this direction are increasing pupil size. So if you want, this is what your pupil is at night when it's wide open. This is what your pupil is in bright light when it's, when it's small, about a millimeter across. And if you're looking at a point source, uh, when you're looking through a small pupil, the point source looks a little bigger just because um, as you get to bigger and bigger apertures, you should, you should in principle see smaller and smaller uh, size objects. But that's if the eye is perfect. This is what the actual uh, typical eye does. Oop, it's not showing. That's not good. Okay, well, well we've lost this. Sorry. Um, all of this stuff got lost in passing. But um, I can tell you that this is what you would see from a point source from a wide open pupil, seven millimeters. So instead of getting smaller and smaller, you're looking through more and more of these imperfections where your eyeball is grabbing onto your cornea and your lens, and it looks awful. So your, your, your spatial resolution is getting worse rather than better as you get to a very big pupil. And what adaptive optics does is it brings you back to this really nice small point source. Sorry, this slide didn't show up very well. So th this is what it actually looks like in real life. These are from Austin Rorta, an image of the retina without adaptive optics. You can sort of see some structure not quite sure what it is. With adaptive optics, each one of these things is what's called a cone photoreceptor. It's, a, it's a, the cell in your eye which detects colored light. You have rods and cones, and these are the cones. And each one of them, there, you know, there are ones that are sensitive to red light, green light, and, and blue light. This is actually the shadow of a blood vessel. The human eye is backwards. The blood vessels are in front of, the, of your retina, and you have to look through all the nerve fibers and blood vessels. Um, my biology friends tell me there's a good reason for that, but I don't know, it seems weird to me. Anyway, uh, people have been able to use images like this to study, for example, what's happening in retinal disease. And if a disease is progressing, 
instead of seeing these nice cones here, you start seeing regions which turn gray and then black. And uh, if you're trying to treat the disease, you can use this to monitor the treatment to see whether it slows down the degeneration or even whether some of these cells uh, revivify themselves. Another thing that's been used for is uh, to study individual cells moving through capillaries. So I don't know if you can see these. These are little white blood cells zooming through the little capillaries right in your retina, right in front of your retina. And uh, this has been used to study blood flow in the eye. For example, if you're diabetic, it turns out that the blood flow can be inhibited. So this is a way to uh, evaluate how, much that, how fast that's happening and so forth. Very exciting stuff. So the main points are um, that adaptive optics and these lasers are new technologies that are now allowing the biggest telescopes on, on the ground to see as clearly as if they were in space. There are still lots of areas where space is better. I want to emphasize this strongly. A lot of wavelengths of light, ultraviolet light, long wavelength infrared light, can't even get through the atmosphere. So you better be in space to see them. And then adaptive optics is still very hard for us to do as the wavelength of the light gets shorter and shorter. So for example, green light, blue light, violet light, we can't do it from the ground yet. I think we will eventually do it, but not yet. And so right now, you're far up better off uh, doing that from space. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that using adaptive optics, we can watch what's happening in very fine detail in the distant universe. In particular, I showed you an example of what happens to black holes in colliding galaxies. And we're starting to uh, use this to study human vision as well. And uh, I, I wanted to talk about a, just a little bit about my pers a personal note about what it's like to be a woman scientist. I had wonderful role models. So my father was a scientist. My mother was an educational administrator at a university. And she was, she was a wonderful lady. She was the first sec woman secretary of the Board of Estimate in New York City. The Board of Estimate is like the city council. And so she was the first woman city council secretary under a really incredible mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia. If you ever read uh, about the history of, of uh, the times around before and after the Depression, he was a, a key figure. <coughs> my parents were both very supportive of, of my interests, whatever they were. and. Um, I, I was reminded when I was thinking about this talk of a, a time when I, a friend of our family's had given me a little telescope because he heard that I was interested in astronomy. And uh, we were out in the countryside and, uh, for visiting friends and I had brought the telescope with me, but everything was so busy. There are people visiting, you know, we didn't have time to set it up and I was very upset. I was in high school and I was probably being pretty obnoxious as we drove home from the countryside to Manhattan where I lived. And I was bugging them, and finally my father got so annoyed, he pulled over off the Taconic State Parkway onto the grass. You know, they had lawns back then by the side of parkways. Probably still do in New York. And he said, okay, you know, 20 minutes, set up your telescope, go over there, stop bothering us. <laughs> but he, you know, it was good. I mean, he stopped, and he helped me carry the telescope up the hill. And <clears throat> I had the telescope up the hill. I was looking at Jupiter. I was real happy. And then this state policeman comes by. <laughs> and he starts berating my father for pulling over. What are you doing? And, and my father tries to explain it. See that person up there? That's my daughter. And she's looking at Jupiter. And the, the, the state policeman says, sir, I've heard all sorts of incredible excuses, but that's the most amazing one I've ever heard. <laughs> so my father had the had the presence of mind to say, oh, no, 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 come up and look. And so I showed this state policeman Jupiter <laughs> through my little telescope. And he said, well, I'll be goddamn. <laughs> uh, I'll be. <laughs> and so he said, well, just pull over more. <laughs> and uh, it's OK, you can keep going. So anyway. Um, and the other thing is my husband is very supportive. So you know, when, when our son was small, he did a lot of the picking up my, my son at daycare because I worked. Uh, 50 miles away at Livermore, and he's a great cook. And uh, most of all, it's been great fun to, to do this. And I, I, uh, for those of you who are considering careers in science, I, all I can say is I've had a wonderful time, and I hope you will too.
Okay, now we'll have the Q&A session, so I'll be reading out the questions that are posted on the Slido site. First, are multiple layers of mirrors required for adaptive optics to work efficiently? Ah, that's a very good question. So, most of the turbulence in the atmosphere is in the last kilometer, right above the ground. And um, if you only want to correct a, a very small region of the sky, sometimes my husband teases me that we're looking through soda straws at, at very small parts of the sky. So you don't need multiple mirrors if, if you just want to look at a small region. But if you want to look at a somewhat larger region, it helps to have mirrors that correct for different heights in the atmosphere. Next, what practical applications are dependent on this field of study? Ah, so uh, one, one of them is certainly um, using, using these devices for the eye. And when we got started in 1999, there was one in a, in a university lab, and now there's hundreds of these devices. They're not yet in your optometrist's office. You know, my, my fantasy is when I go in to get my glasses, the optometrist will pull out this little shoebox full of adaptive optics and look in my eye and tell me that my retina is detaching or something. <laughs> or hopefully not, but, uh, <laughs> but it's not yet at that stage, but it's in a lot of big clinics, for example. And um, the adaptive optics is also used inside la high power lasers. It's used for imaging the interior of cells and biology to see what's happening to the chromosomes and the, and the subcellular structures. Um, what else? <coughs> it's used in some aspects of photolithography. So it's, it's getting around. It's not a general purpose tool. You have to have a real need for it, but there are turning out to be a lot of needs. Okay. Next, are tilting segmented mirrors also used in conjunction for adaptive optics? Tilting segmented mirrors. So you can make a deformable mirror out of a uniform piece of glass or a uniform um, membrane that's put on a, on a semi, on a, basically on a microchip. Or you can um, make it out of segments, either macroscopic segments that are this big or that big, um, or little tiny segments that are made uh, in what's called MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. And uh, so they, if you have little tilting, say, <coughs> sorry. That works just as well as, as a uniform sheet. <coughs> Is adaptive optics a more advanced telescope with lasers? Well, I think so. <laughs> uh, you don't, you don't, if, you don't, if you have a bright star near your object, don't use a laser, use a star. But if you don't, then it's definitely improved by having the laser. Um. Why does yellow light excite sodium atoms? Do any other wavelengths of light have the same effect? Ah, good question. So this is quantum mechanics now, so bear with me. The, ele the electrons in an atom can only move from one energy level to another in discrete chunks. And the yellow light is exactly the, carries exactly the energy that's needed to um, access the, the ground state and the first excited state of the sodium atom. So it's a very strong transition. Every, every um, excitation in the sodium atom ends up falling back to the ground state. Or that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's, a, it's, a, it's the strongest transition that we could find uh, that would respond to a kind of light that we could actually make with the laser. It turns out that meteorites, of course, aren't just made of sodium. There's, there's iron, potassium, all sorts of metals and stuff, but this particular transition is a very strong one. I used to be able to tell people, like you guys, that that yellow light is the color of the street lamps in the tunnel under the, under the Bay Bridge. It's that yellow light that sometimes is in, old, in parking lots. <clears throat> but when they put in the new Bay Bridge, they took out the yellow light, so now I can't say that anymore. <laughs> How common is adaptive optics in telescopes around the world today? Um, as I said, most of the biggest telescopes today, 8 to 10 meters in size, from here to that wall, um, have adaptive optic systems. The smaller telescopes, 3 to 5 meters or 1 to 3 meters, it's, it's a little sketchy. The, the, <coughs> the technology is still sufficiently expensive that for a, 
One meter telescope, the adaptive optic system, until very recently has cost as much as the telescope did, which is sort of embarrassing. So people don't tend to go for that. We're trying to make them cheaper. <coughs> wow. Can lasers interfere with airplanes? Ah, yes. Okay, so that's a great question. We have to uh, clear any new laser facility with the Federal Aviation Administration. We're not allowed to shine a laser anywhere near an airplane. And um, so what we do is we have various ways to tell when an airplane is coming close and we automatically shutter the laser until the airplane's gone. And uh, in Mauna Kea, Hawaii, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, there's almost never airplanes flying overhead. Uh, all the local routes that hop from island to island in the Hawaiian chain are, are on the horizon. And um, for some reason, the midnight FedEx flight from LA to uh, Tokyo never flies over us. So we basically almost never have to shutter the laser. On the other hand, at Lick Observatory, which is right above in San Jose here, there are tons of airplanes going over, and, and we have to shutter the laser quite a bit. Were adaptive optics used in the recent research in the South Pole where gravitational waves were studied to theorize how the universe was created? Nope, wasn't used. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting work, though. In the fabric of time and space, what impact do black holes have? <coughs> um, so one way to think of the very strong gravity of a, of a black hole is that it actually bends uh, space and makes it curved instead of flat. There are other ways to describe the field, but, but that's what I find the most intuitive way. So you may have seen these um, sketches that look like a, a funnel coming out of, there's a very narrow region in the middle and the black hole's in the middle and then there's this funnel that flattens out to flat space-time, which is what we live in. Um, it's, a, it's a way to describe the force of gravity when Einstein's equations of general relativity apply. I think, I think that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Um, <coughs> how far away is the nearest black hole to Earth? Oh, peop uh, that's not actually known. Um, ordinary stars can end up their lives as black holes. And so uh, if there's gas falling into one of these former ordinary stars, you can see it light up. And there are black holes in our galaxy that are fairly nearby, but none that we've found in the immediate vicinity of the solar system. How come other stars in the galaxy don't get sucked into the black hole in the center of the galaxy? Great question. OK, so we like to say that, and I think I said it, I probably shouldn't have, that black holes are cosmic vacuum cleaners and anything that gets nearby gets sucked in and stuff. Well, that's not quite true. If, you know, if, let's think about our solar system. Here's the sun and here's the earth going around the sun. And the only thing that keeps us in our orbit is the gravity of the earth, of gravity of the sun, gravitational pull of the sun. And the thing that keeps us from falling into the sun is, is the centrifugal force that we're going around in a circle. And we have enough centrifugal force to keep us from falling in. So if tonight, when we went to sleep, the sun was replaced by a black hole of exactly the same mass, and it was still dark out, we wouldn't know the difference. It would be exactly the same. We still have enough centrifugal force because we're going in orbit around it to not fall in. So of course, then the sun wouldn't rise and we'd get upset. But uh, <laughs> from the point of view of, of the orbit of the Earth, it would make no difference at all. So in order to fall into a black hole, you have to have lost that angular momentum. You have to be coming more at a, on an orbit that, that aims right at the sun instead of going around it, right at the black hole instead of going around it as well. Um, is it possible for a black hole to interfere with satellite connection? Uh, <laughs> I guess it depends how close it was. <laughs> I mean, uh, if a black hole flew by us, it would mess up all the orbits of the satellites, that's for sure. So I, I'm not quite sure what was meant by that. Does, some, does somebody want to ask her? Does the person who asked want to clarify the question? No, okay. That's okay, too. <laughs> um, 
Is the Keck telescope orbiting in space like the Hubble telescope, or is it on Earth? No, so there are, there are two Keck telescopes, and on, they're on the top of the volcano in the Big Island of Hawaii. It's called um, Mauna Kea Volcano, 14,000 feet. Okay, and the last question is, have you ever been in an accident in space? No. Nope. <laughs> I should say not yet. <laughs> My mother, um, who died when she was 94, fairly recently, always felt that it, it would be great fun to go for a vacation on the moon. And, w you know, and, and she wasn't a scientist, but when, um, when man first went to the moon and the, we watched them all on video walking around the moon, she was very enthralled with this and said she hoped that before she died, getting to the moon would become so routine that somebody would put up hotels and you could just pay and go up there and see what it was like. I thought that was really cool. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Okay, so we're out of time for the Q&A now. So thank you so much, Dr. Yep. Claire Max, for speaking with us today. Um, I think you serve as a great inspiration for all the students here, and especially for the young girls in the audience. Thank you. Good. Thanks a lot. <laughs>